thank you, Joshana, for being here to talk about eco villages. Mm. This has been something that's been talked about in our core group meetings for a long time. So you are brave enough to be here and talk about it. I don't know how much it what is. Five it? after eight. Okay. How much attention do you have? So much time. Lots. Oh, I have so much material. I have way more even already presented. So uh, when I feel your interest starting to sag, I'll just check back in with you. Just the nitty gritty in 25 minutes. No. The nitty gritty. I think yes. Oh. And go ahead. The other thing is, if you're just, if you need to leave, just leave quietly, and those who are continue to be alert and interesting can stay. So mm -hmm. that usually works. Yeah. I think I, so I had like four main things I was going to talk to you about. It's going to give you a little bit of introduction about who I am and how I got interested. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the definition of an echo village is, how they're defined. This summer I went to the Global Echo Village Network, a conference in Portugal, so I have a report on that and I have like reports of echo villages all around the world that are incredibly exciting, of which I tried to narrow it down to a few. And I'd like to talk to about um, Echo Villages Maui, which is a group that was meeting regularly for a while, of which we have a few members here. Um, and I'll show a little bit of our slideshow and what we were doing to actually be active about Echo Villages here on Maui. And then I was asked to look at some of the challenges to Echo Villages that we're currently up against. So what I have is like a lot of really good news from around the world and a lot of really challenging news for how to put that good news into practice right here. So I want to try to keep it inspiring and excited and also be real, which is a, a, a kind of tough thing to do. So about myself, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all because I've literally been talking about Echo Villages for over 30 years. I, um, since a really young kid, I looked around and the common thing I always thought is there has to be a better way. You know, I grew up in a normal dysfunctional family in a 1950s track neighborhood, you know, the um, Cape Cods, one right after the other. And I had the good fortune at the ripe old age of 13 of taking LSD and walking around this neighborhood. And I got really clear in that walk that um, I was being trained to be a cog in a wheel of an industrial machine. That the whole way that this whole development was set up it had nothing to do with the blossoming of my soul. And it had a whole lot more to do with putting me in a box. And so I became a child from hell in school and that I asked questions all the time and I never stopped asking questions. And the question I really wanted to know is how can we put people harmoniously within the environment where both the environment and people thrive? And I've been asking that question nonstop. So when I went to college, I looked for environmental science, which way back then didn't even exist. I mean, there was a time when we were sort of doing boxes on everything and environmental science was a new field. Once I got mostly into environment science, I realized that I missed people a little bit, so I have a double degree in environmental science and anthropology. My senior year, this is way back, I don't mind dating myself because I begin to get credence now. <laughs> in 1979, I wrote a paper called The Paraprimitive Solution, a utopian answer to the problems of alienation. This was the beginning of echo villages in my little world. I looked at the anthropological way people have lived, you know, indigenous cultures for thousands of years, and I said, these guys have something going on. And maybe we could take modern technology, work with what we've lost from this way of life. So the para-primitive solution to the problem of alienation is now called echo villages. <laughs> An equally alienating word because it conjures up things in everybody's mind. So from that degree in those two things. I went on for a master's in social ecology. And I mean, this conversation back then was not as alive as it is now. We were considered kooks, and, and a, a strong environmentalist were always mm -hmm. marginalized. And so that I figured the more academia I could get, the more it kind of legitimatized this. So I went on and got a PhD in, in philosophy. And then continued to be on this topic by doing tours of communities all across the United States. I did my first tour like in 1983, went to every community that was kind of on the inter intentional communities uh, little magazine that was just getting going. So then I continued, I went and lived at Finhorn, which is a major community in Scotland, one of the, it's turning 50 this year, 
I'll be going back for the 50th birthday. Lived there for five years, traveled for them in South America, and was determined when I left cold, gray, dreary Scotland that I was going to go someplace warm and sunny and do an echo village and have been trying to get that to happen for many years. So my challenge is not to be cynical. <laughs> and you will notice it is going to creep in. I do tend to, um, having been part of many community ventures that got going, I don't know how many different um, times I've sat in circles of people that wanted to plan an echo village and we had 12 cents among the 18 of us in the room. So <laughs> numbers of times we had like lots of great enthusiasm and not a whole lot of resources. So. Um, I'm also going to make some assumptions tonight and make some assumptions that we, upcountry sustainability, you know a whole lot about post peak oil, climate change, and aspects of sustainability. So I'm going to go kind of quick through some of these. I also just recently completed the Echo Village Design Course certification thing. So I'm like chock full of, there's so much <laughs> stuff on this computer, and I can just yak so much. So if I'm going too fast, you can slow me down, or you just let it drift by and look at the nice pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, if I stand here, am I blocking anybody's view? Can I do this from here? Do you need somebody um, to click for you, or you? I might bounce back up and down then. You want a button pusher? Yeah. yeah, you want to button push? At one point, I might just. Hit. If I can get out of the way, yeah. Yeah, I think this. There you go. Okay. So, pretty much everywhere you look, and as an environmentalist in 1979, I already thought they told us 12 years of topsoil left, things were dire then, and I've been like waiting for things to fall for over 30 years. So, it's pretty amazing to me we've gone this far. So some major things to look at is our lifestyle. You can see how dark this is. This is our capacity to consume ectors compared to everybody else. We have been consuming the world's resources. You all know this. I don't mean to make you feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Except look at the number of planets. It would take five planets for everyone to, to live the kind of lifestyle that we're living. I mean, these kind of numbers just can be getting bombarded at you. So at our current state of life, which everyone is now hoping to achieve, which anybody who watches U.S. television or U.S. media all has in their mind that their development in their country is going to give them two cars, a refrigerator, and five planets worth of stuff. We don't have five planets worth of stuff. Well, I didn't know that this, this did this. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going until you say something. Wow. Dang. Well, I could be talking to you the whole time about this, but it's going to do this cool thing. So just going to keep going? Yeah, future time. These are where we are now. This is called post-peak oil. Baby boom's hitting the whole thing. And these are various solutions. The red line hasn't come. So a lot of us from this point forward... Oh, yeah. Stop there for a moment. <laughs> We've got the techno fantasy. Some technology is going to come along and save the day. Free energy. Wouldn't that be great? Free energy and all our problems are solved. Or there's green tech stability. All we need is more windmills, more this and that, and we'll be able to just coast on out of here. And then there's the creative descent or permaculture, which earth stewardship. And then there's the kind of collapse. And the next slide should hopefully go faster than that. We're calling the techno fantasy denial. <laughs> Great text is really bargaining. Uh, transition was acceptance, and Mad Mac is despair. So pretty much the stages of that. <coughs> I don't want need to do that very much, but we'll see. Okay. So just briefly, if we did have free energy, for example, I had a, a very lively discussion with a, a new age friend of mine who was totally into this. Technology is going to save us, some aliens are going to come and do this. Well, even if that's so, we have World Economic Risk Survey. Next slide. I didn't know that broke up either. <laughs> the risk yeah. interconnection. So even should any one of those elements come along, um, and we had free energy, there's still limiting factors like Coltran, things that we use to make computers, or, or water. The next slide. Water use. So we can maybe get free energy, but where are we going to get water from? So I'm just kind of making a case for, chances are our lifestyle has to change. You know that already, so we go ahead. Yeah. So 
in this training that I did, there's a full spectrum of how we can start to do the transition. And we start off with a vision, plans or pathways to get there, and a set of principles that guide that. This is a lot of what um, Bill had. Bill had like the perfect planning department presentation to proceed this with. You to go on. So it, there's transition town movement again. People looking at future scenarios again. And the, a lot of our future has been determined by Hollywood. You know, we've got this, you know, these ones real fast. The future scenario, you know, like, who's creating our future scenarios? There's been a lot of apocalyptic stuff, so. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, alternative technology, what are we going to create in our future? You go ahead. So we want a positive vision that creates its own call to action and self-selects an initiating group. I think Upcountry Sustainability is that group and that there are many of us that are looking forward to that here. And so visioning our future, what would a post-carbon energy scarce world look like? And you can do it in little pieces, you know, there's lots of cool little things that can be done. But I'm going to just talk about the spectrum. So many of us have participated in community groups based on shared interests. Like this is a community group. You get that good feeling when you work together with other people. And as far as Americans go, that's like a really good place to be. You have a, a place you belong, you work together, it feels good, but you go home and you have your private life, which is really how we mostly like to manage things. Then there's communities built by location or traditional development like Pukulani, like the, what Bill just presented to us. And then I mentioned Hui's people sharing land together, possible joint ownership and decision making, and questionable legality. But Hui's <laughs> our, uh, like our Maui sort of gray area that we're, we're working with based on the Hawaiian principles that we inherited. And then we go on. And then there are these, what I call pseudo or farm communities. They look and feel like a real community, but have a central owner who makes all important decisions and decides who can stay. <laughs> so this, there was a community group that said they wanted to go out and visit communities in Kipahulu, and I just had to be sort of nasty and say, there are no communities in Kipahulu. There are really clever landowners who know how to get people to work for them for free and make it feel like a community experience. It's another form of surf or slave labor. So, I don't shut up. <laughs> Co-housing is another popular one. It's becoming in. You have an independent lives, but you share some aspects of community life, such as shared ownership of common land and decision making about some aspects of community life. Usually, everybody has an independent income. But you do, there's a common area that people share. You're brought into this next level of engagement with people that you're living with, you know, and it's pretty kind of nicely defined where the community exists and where your life is independent. Then there's intentional communities, and there is a, there is a range of intentional communities um, based on what people brought them together, you know, from hippie communes with total income sharing to urban neighborhood clusters. And, hey, quick. <laughs> this is a complete whole systems design, challenging the way we think and live in order to create regenerative and sustainable ways of living that honor all of life on Earth. I feel really grateful to have followed um, Bill, because he described exactly what um, would look like an eco village. You know, like any of those well-functioning whole system design could potentially, like, what's the difference between that and an eco village? Really, what's the difference? Except for, yeah, we do, we push it. <laughs> so, I'll push again. In the Echo Village design, because now in the community world, there's a distinction. We're drawing the line between intentional communities that have like a small portion of the whole package. But now we have enough full spectrum communities. Finthorn is one of them, Dom and Hoor is one. They're large enough where they're actually taking in all of these. You know, they're challenging the way we do economics, challenging the way that we organize our social structures, challenging our worldview and our ecological. So at every level, like let's say in, in your beautiful transitional town or traditional neighborhood, we're still stuck with having to do regular sewage systems. And I know that in your own project, you're really working hard on that. But one of the differences sure. is an echo village would want to have its own closed loop systems of waste management. It would want to relook at how do we do our energy, and chances are they would want to have 
small scale energy patterns for each traditional. We're just taking it a little step further. So it's so like, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, you're doing it exactly with this. You yeah. do that. Exactly. Well, it's not it. Yeah. It's not it. Right. So in this body of work, um, the, the fifth dimension is the you know, whole system's design, which is kind of in the center. So worldview would also include your spirituality. I don't know if you really need to read all of these. I mean, I could talk at length about all of them, but you're getting the picture. That it's kind of taking our American lifestyle and re-examining every aspect of it. From the, what you get up and you eat in the morning, to how you're relating, to how you got that food, your decision making. And there's no set um, way to do that. Each group of people on each group of land is going to make different decisions leading to a different echo village. So we can go on. So this conference that I went to, these are the main echo villages networks that there are, but we just birthed a global echo village network, Africa, which is huge and taking off. So this is the next slide, and Gaia Education, and we'll stop there. So what's been happening is while we in America here, we've been kind of busy shopping, I think, and <laughs> talking to each other. Um, the rest of the world has gone ahead and is just, just jamming with this Echo Village concept. And um, I hadn't even realized, and I'm in the movement, how far um, other villages have gone. Like what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Russia. So I, I brought you some slides from a few wide spectrum of communities. But for the moment, I was just, just going to do this little play thing. I'm, I, I can do this really fast because Bill helped us out a lot with his presentation. Let's say for us, of country sustainability and for our concerns about food security, we wanted to build an echo village and put it around the farm. And then in order to like, wow, this went really fast. Stop, because it's right there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I actually was doing wrong. Oh, back at that side, yeah. Yep, yeah, I'm back, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's there. That's good. Yeah, good enough. I was just going to build them one at a time. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So we have at the center of the farm food security, you'll need farmers for that. And then what are we already paying for? Like in my mind, when I was trying to create a development that there's already money going for assisted living and hospice for elders. So could we not channel that money into this Echo Village concept and begin to create jobs? So if you, I mean, it's a logical thing to have that, to have health care, to look at um, teens to young adults, job training. And they're all things that are currently social services, which could easily be done probably more effectively um, and less cost by a group of people on a piece of land working amongst themselves without this huge bureaucracy on each and every level. So then, uh, obviously, you have the farm restaurant, daycare, and then it builds from there. Then you can do the next ones. You've got the social services, farm products. And then we, we jumped one every... So we got job creation from problems to possibilities. Now, like if you just look at how to create jobs, and where an Echo Village is going to take that another step further is in that next slide, where we're going to look at resource flow, water, waste, energy, and economics. So in addition to that, we'd have the renewable energy systems, community banking, closed loop waste systems, education, the arts. You, you start putting all that stuff together. And it's at this scale that you can then, you know, have your wind farm for those 600 to 1,000 people in that range, these traditional neighborhoods um, that would go. So let's go forward. Next slide. So while we're, like I said, we're busy shopping, all these different groups put together. Next slide. Oh, okay, wasn't that. They're all pioneering sort of like Echo Village toolkits, ways in which, you know, what were best practices that worked? Um, how did they do that here? So in many ways, we don't need to invent anything. It's all been done. So many of these systems have been done, even at our climate level. Um, you know, I, in our attempt to get Echo Village in Maui, we were asking for a research and um, experimental station. And in actuality, we don't really don't need to research that much or even experiment that much because it's been already done. So I want to show you who some of these people are. This is Pintor, which is a spiritual community, and they're now fully into Echo Village work. We've got Dragon Dreamy, Clover Culture, Damanpur. These are all groups that help support the next level. These are 
the Echo Village Sustainability Toolkits, they're all being put into that. So that at the conference, the incredible news was Jen was being approached by German government, went to them, the um, different governments are going to Jen and saying, look, we need help doing some of this development work. And the German government's particularly interested in developing Africa so that as Africa's resettlement communities and local indigenous communities want to come online to being really modern, if we could get their traditional way of being but with increased technology, if, with that before they get into this big consumer module thing, if we could grab it now, let them think that in this echo village they're the cutting edge of the world and we start visiting them, we can prevent a lot of the disasters that will normally happen in either refugee resettlement communities, you know, the traditional ways that we're helping folks. So now we'll go on. Um, this, this was, I heard reports from all around the world. So this blew me away because I grew up with the Cold War, the Russians, you know, these big, gnarly, nasty people that wanted my everything. <laughs> they were going to come kill us, they were going to do all this <laughs> stuff. So the Russians got up and they did a report. This is Kapatschek. I'll just let you read that kind of quickly. We're just going into one particular Echo Village's plan at the moment. And then we can go. <clears throat> Next slide. And we can kind of do these kind of quickly because we're, we're just going to Russia. That's too fast. What were those little things? Right there. That's the beehives, I think. Beehives, oh, organic we, we can go that fast if you talk to us about what we're seeing. Okay, the next one. Next one. Okay, I'll stop here for a minute. Because one of the things that is the benefit of Russia is their government collapsed. So when you, when you have no government and you have this necessity, then you recognize that there's a lot of social capital in the room that like right here, right now, we have a wealth of resources amongst us, we have a wealth of energy, our BTUs possible of energy outlay is incredible, <laughs> our heart capacity when we get together, if we would put ourselves in a love meter, it's just phenomenal. And that's what you discover when everything else goes bad. One thing that I've noticed is most echo villages take over educating their children. They no longer want their kids to go to traditional systems. So that's like, then we go, this is it. They three forms. These are our, our Russian little kids. So this is fairly typical of an echo village. They have to have a, a business together. So they're doing the forests, the sawmill, woodworking, and then they have education seminars. And I just love that this Cold War. These people are doing echo beekeeping, echo house construction, echo living, stove construction, herbal motherhood, and then we can. So this is their infrastructure. And you should have seen these guys. They were so proud, these two Russian guys. This is our infrastructure. And for them, this is major. They manage all together to buy this kind of equipment, with, and they're working it. And this is 250 people. Yeah. So we can kind of cruise through this. making sweet little small homes. This for a second. Because this is us, isn't it? Doesn't this look like a, this is a Waldorf school event? <laughs> this is downtown Paia. <laughs> these, these are us. This is us. Only we're in Russia doing it. Because we don't have a government stopping us. <laughs> so next one. That's us, right? Doing yoga with organic vegetables. <laughs> Yeah. And most echo villages don't get too far along before the media comes and discovers them, and it's really important to manage your media imagery. Um, Finhorn suffered a lot in its beginning stages. They, they assumed that people knew what was happening, and the disconnect between how the media perceived them and who they actually were created a long-term strife with their neighbors that has now been resolved. Wow. And then, so this is just them, they're already get, making TV. It is so hot around the world. Like you get these presentations on YouTube, we can go again. I love this next one. 
This is how many echo villages there are in Russia. Now, it, it also shows you that 2,500 groups started in the last 10 years. Only 250 of them actually got land. And now there's 100 living echo villages. There are awful statistics in the community movement, like 90% of them fail. Mm -hmm. And so there is books and there are you know, things available, like what are the communities that are doing right? What are they doing? And you know, I can point you to those materials and I can tell you about them. They're very important because humans have a hard time getting on with each other. <laughs> we do. We have very particular ways it's supposed to be. But this to me is very exciting. So I go to the next one. And I, I actually just loved this, of course, with songs and hot dances. <laughs> They're us. So they have a big network. So this is their international meeting with 32, 60 representatives. Mm -hmm. on. Yeah, again. And this is what South Country Sustainability is doing, more or less. You have like 40 prepared learning topics that people interested in getting back to the land will have that you can pull out at any time. Traditional dance is very good practice. <laughs> Excellent. Very important habit. <laughs> I think we can go, we have to go a little quicker, so. This is the one I was talking about. All of these guys are putting together the toolkit for developers, effective model for planning and implement, implementation. So like really, we don't have to do anything. The resource has already been done. We can go ahead. It's being put together right now. The Echo Village Network will have a link to that. They're part of this. Okay, this presentation blew me away completely, and I, you'll see why in a second. We're going to go to South Africa right now. Um, we can go on. I just want to say I can't imagine a Cold War resuming with that kind of a community. You know, a hundred of those kind of communities living in that country. You know, it's like yeah, but they weren't the only sound in Cold War. Yeah. <laughs> so we can go. True. So um, this luxury lodges and private game reserves. Wilderness well, big five animals. Twenty thousand residents. I think we skipped one. That one. Next one right there. In between. There's one in between. Oh, maybe not. Is and then maybe the it's one? the next one. 10,000 people living in shacks, no skills training or job creation. This is outside poverty, malnutrition, and illness, people living on rubbish. Water, a scarce resource. So this is fairly typical in South Africa that you would have a luxury game reserve right next to a township that has zilch. Only in this particular one, the water, here we go. So water was the issue there. The, you show how dry the township was, and yet the water that was there was being used for sewage. So we'll go. We don't need to really look at that. But water will be the next big thing. We've got post-peak oil, but water's our next and coming thing. So looking at... I don't know if I, I should read these aloud or just let yes. me read them. Read them, please. Well, water for, and for growth and development, for health and sanitation, rainfall decreasing due to climate change may cause future conflicts around the world, a limited resource, especially in African townships, vital for local economic development and prosperity, boreholes are not a su sustainable solution due to increasing, decreasing water tables, and is recycled up to seven times in developed countries before being released into the sea. So cleaning water nature's way, rocks, plants, sunlight, decentralized wastewater treatment systems. So the people who presented this ran the game preserve. They needed people to work in their, their golf course, their game preserve. Thing. So they looked towards the township. And luckily enough, they had vision and care and concern. And they made a partnership. So they're taking the water coming through the township, and they're cleaning it up. And biogas shelter and aerobic bath of constructed wetland, polishing ponds, just like in the previous slide, channeling storm water to reed beds, cleaning through nature, recharging groundwater aquifers, 
transforming polluted water into crystal clear water. And then we have clean, nutrient-rich wastewater in Lensing to irrigate chemical-free organic food gardens, community nursery, medicinal herb gardens, golf driving range, nine-hole par three golf course. This is why this blew me away. We're, we're going to go to the world of golf, which in Hawaii has been just a headache for me. But here they are. <laughs> 40% lost water, 60% higher yield, four crops a year, so they're working with people. Transforming wasteland by irrigation of recycled wastewater to create a sustainable environmental showcase, the first organic African nine-hole par three edible. <laughs> so no to precious freshwater resources, irrigation losing 70% of water, exotic planting, yes! 100% naturally recycled wastewater, the town ships water is coming over here, irrigation at night, local compost. And then again, so they're also doing um, different ground covers, they do pest control through planting, again. So here's the clubhouse right next to the garden, you get to see two pictures of the clubhouse. And it doesn't look like a normal golf course, obviously, in that particular just do a bunch. Mm. Another. So the whole township has gotten involved. We'll go. Sowing, growing, harvesting. Mm. Big on medicinal plants, planting and growing, teaching indigenous knowledge for primary health care. Okay. Now, you know, we were looking at a wasteland. We've got the books, pens, computers, but the next picture. They are not doing normal education. They are doing sustainable environmental education. Mm. And a zero waste township. This is unheard of in Africa. Mm. But yeah, chicken skin I got. Not only are they doing a golf course, but they completely transformed. And this is the kind of developments that um, Jen is being turned to because these people were connected with um, Gen Africa before Gen Africa existed. It just takes a little bit of vision, you apply it with a lot of social capital, and things like this can happen. What does GIN stand for? Again? Global Echo Village Network. Okay. So we'll just finish up there. So you've got the low cost housing, you'll see how this is made. People just did it together, they were doing it with bags of sand, organic mm -hmm. produce. And the amazing thing is, now they take the golfers and they give them options to go into the township. And they're watching how this is a German couple that went in, fell in love with some people, and there's a lot of person-to-person -person exchange. People go to South Africa to seek big game animals and golf, and they end up making connection with local townspeople that they then have for the rest of their lives. So it's been this amazing good news story. And one of these guys presented can't see him at the moment, but he got a standing ovation. We were all just like, oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs> so now going to the Emerging Echo Village Network in Congo. And you're at 32 minutes. I'm at 32. 32. Oh, thank you. So, so anybody that's sleepy and needs to go home to bed, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, we're interesting. <laughs> yeah, you're, doing, you're doing fabulous. It's wonderful. It's real. <laughs> Okay, we're in the world. We're in a central location within Africa, 49 African countries. Well, that's good enough. Biodiversity. <laughs> Stop right there. It's freezing. Okay, good. Coltan is short for columbite, a black tar like mineral found in major quantities in the Congo. Congo presents a minimum of 64% of the world's reserves of coltan. I think we can skip. It's been foreign corporate exploitation. We know the story. Next picture. This is the stuff that Coltan's in, in, involved in. So it's going to be a very important thing. Partly I'm showing you this because if we think we're up against, you know, sugar plantations and we're up against, you know, old boy bureaucracies, these guys are up against multinationals from around the world coming to get reserves of which the entire world wants. So they're kind of up against it. You know, and so the point of this is, this is very encouraging. Next one. Look at these folks. Now, they don't look like us, but they are us. Because these guys are pioneering a new way of being, a new way of living. Can you imagine, you, you look like you've got nothing, 
here in this Echo Village network, we can stop there. Those are actually all different Echo Villages. This is so much like what my new age friends would love as a picture with all the hands together. <laughs> it's kind of us. It's a collaborative effort. Next slide. So, I mean, folks who have nothing, they got together to defend and improve the rights of small farmers, dedicated to contribute to the development of the nation post-war. And then again, this just shows the amount of people that they have. They have over 100,000 current members, 30,000 of which are based in one particular area alone. Next slide. These are some of the crops that they're working with. Again, up close of like, this is us. Again. Uh, a big portion of Echo Village stuff is getting away from the religious divide. So, so far, I haven't heard of any particular Echo Village claiming a religious, that's not to say that they don't exist, but a very important world view is one of open spirituality, so that we get away from the, the, the division through spiritual things. Next slide. And for Africa, this is huge, creating an environment where all women and children feel safe, and women are free to reclaim the rightful position in the community as nurturers, offering a space for widowed, sexually abused, and displaced women and orphaned and displaced youth. And next slide. Imagine that millions have been killed and continue to die. Hundreds of thousands of women have been systematically raped and are still being brutalized. Corporate plundering reigns. The second largest rainforest in the world being destroyed and mass crimes have been committed and remain widespread. Yet the world has been deadly silent. This is modern day Congo. And then the next slide. And then the next one. So, he brought this, this presentation, I gave you a very abbreviated version of it. He brought us to tears. I mean, we like to think of ourselves as one global family, and I often bitch and moan and complain about how difficult it is to get anything done in Maui towards things like this. But if these guys can do it in the Congo, up against every known force, war, multinationals, um, a government that's not working in their favor, the point that I want to make with this slideshow is we can do this. You know, I think it just takes, um, well, that's a little bit later. I think you said it, we can do this. We. 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 Yeah. That's not a so. Yeah, it's a we. And then, oh yeah, we'll just go quick, just to show Turkey, so you can just be like real quick. Well, that was real quick. <laughs> can you go back? Yes, please. <laughs> Farmer's markets. All right, great. And Six. Yeah, we thought Sorry. it doesn't matter. There. There we go. Just you know how they're being able to transform the landscape through farming. Again, in Turkey with very little money. People are hungry. When you're hungry, you go and work the land. Permablitz. Yeah, it's permablitz. <laughs> so this is their farm and a community supported agriculture. Just getting a feeling for how organic you saw his little thing. Now this is their modern technology, the combination between traditional roots in Turkey and a modern greenhouse. They're looking at doing some biofuels. So we can do these fairly quickly. And the next. And then you see like people in very traditional dress combined with the modern technology. And yet choosing to have very simple simple technology for their own homes. So modern technology when it, it applies and simple technology. Again. That's us, <laughs> from a different part of the world. One more slide, there we go. Um, I may be needing to skip this. A lot of times what happens is Echo Villages, once they start taking care of themselves, and I see an awakening of the heart, naturally the heart wants to go out and help the rest of the world. So this is an initiative from Tamara. They are actively going down to um, the Middle East. Next slide. They put themselves in areas of trauma in order to draw attention to it, bringing their first world media down to places. And it will stop here. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is them doing the, the peace walk in, um, 
between Israel and Palestine. And then moving on. Okay, this is the group. This is, uh, as we'll see, this is me. Alina's here in the room. Jamay, David's made it, David Johnson, Susanna, and Wayne Axelson actually put a, this presentation together really well. We spent um, a good portion of a year meeting together regularly and strategizing how could we help further this Echo Village idea in Maui. So Bill was one of the recipients of our good nature. He was a good natured recipient of our pressure. Since he's doing Oluwalu, we went, met, met with him and said, you know, we would like to see these things incorporated into a plan. And to his good credit, he had most of them already incorporated into the plan. The one piece we were sort of really hoping to see was more agriculture, which yeah. we had in there. Which has been changed since. And it's been changed yeah. since. See, our group is affected. <laughs> So this presentation is one that we were putting together, and our plan was to go to each and every county council member. We had already started with the planning department. We spoke with the different people. We're pretty much doing one-on-one -on -one educations. This is not the entire presentation I gave them. I just shortened it for us to get a feel for what it's like. So in the last 100 years, Hawaii's lifestyle has become completely dependent on imports and the cheap oil fueling global commerce. Now there's different ways of approaching Echo Villages. The common thought is to use post-peak oil as a motivator. I'm not of that persuasion myself, or even using climate change of a motivator. I'm more of like lifestyle, quality of life, uh, affordability. There are different ways that we can have this conversation where we don't have to argue about whether we're out of oil. We don't have to argue about the climate. We could just ask ourselves, can you afford to live on Maui? I mean, there's a big category of us who who struggle with that, and then there's another category of people for whom think that that's kind of a silly question. So we have this um, kind of inequality of, of wealth here. And that's more my conversation, but Wayne was putting this together. <laughs> um, this is a very powerful video I recommend to everybody. It's how Cuba survived the post peak oil. Yeah, it's a very good one. And again, you get a real big sense of our social capital, of what we are worth as people. That's an easy one. That's Honolulu. Yes. Cute little thing to get you kind of inspired, like, oh, wouldn't you like to live there? <laughs> <laughs> and another place that we had, we had talked to is um, uh, another developer who has a lot of land around uh, Wailuku. And we could easily see um, you know, like just adding an echo village to this little thing. And we were like, doing our little thing, like, yeah. So here's a picture of that land where we wanted to put our echo village. And again, and there's our planning department. That's the office you go to in order to get your permits. If anybody's ever been through that process, you never want to see this slide again. We've <laughs> been there enough. I, go, and I think we can kind of just, next one on that one, we'll read it better if you just hit it one more time. So ours was to ask for research and development zones for solution testing. Radical simplicity and resource sharing. One other difference with the tradition with what Bill presented is we're actually asking and calling for a reduction of everything, a reduction of the size of our houses, the materials we use in our lives. Just, you know, this whole mass of abundance we've been living. It's just hard to even imagine that we have, you know storage rooms downtown and to take care of our extra stuff. Like, mm -hmm. rethink all of this. Craft a lifestyle localization. Bills, again, everything within walking distance. Affordable tenure, food security, simpler and slower, mutual support, climate-friendly lifestyle. Nice pictures of them. Current zoning facilitates sprawl. <laughs> we know this. Look at how ugly that is. Cluster housing to preserve land for agricultural and natural spaces. I may get a chance to talk about this. This is a project I was on in Kipupulu, which um, we had a long story of trying to create a community-based land trust with people living and doing agriculture. So I kind of know the steps of going through the county of what it takes to do an ag farm. And clustered housing is part of the Maya Island plan. Again. Our main thing is we wanted to make sure ag land didn't get all divided up into little farms because otherwise we're screwed. Simply put. <laughs> Next. Going to work the land together. 
Good. I think we can. I love this one. Reestablish emotional and spiritual connection to the land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of these are fun just to look at, you know, different materials and buildings from around us. So this is where we're trying to get um, all our county councils into the warm fuzzy feeling, <laughs> enable innovation. That's Wayne. He's in his. I think that's just a bicycle looking like a funny thing, but he's trying. <laughs> this is the living machine at Fintorn. So this um, is a water treatment plant. It's um, totally permitted. It's serving 600 people. And the water comes in and just goes through this whole system, comes out perfectly clear. It's a totally viable, totally easy thing to do. We don't need to research it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sewage. Where is that rather than sewage plant? That's it. Yeah, comes out cleaner than the groundwater. That's operating in Finthorn, Scotland. So this was giving them an idea of how we could be cutting edge, you know, because yeah, all of these things are possible. I think you had the very same slide learned from our predecessors. Okay, so stop there. So next I had a, a series of slides on some of the challenges for why we're here. And I can also talk about Ola Hanu, a very specific and um, concrete example here at Maui. I'm aware of the time though, and I probably need to leave time for question and answer. What time do we have? It's 8.54. 8.54. Okay. Right at 45 minutes. Good. Right at 45 minutes. Yeah. So, I could, you know, just briefly, what do you all think is the main reason why we're not having eco villages on Maui? Politics. People are saying politics, building code, zoning. Capitalism, lack of freedom, commitment. We need our government to collapse quickly. We need, yes, we need our government to collapse quickly. All right, I'll just do the next one. You're, you're probably going to get really mad at me because I say we a lot. We in the idea that, you know, all of us are part of this. I am part of this. We're all part of this. So the next slide, I believe, is the, our challenges. So, I'll just go quickly. Status quo of large dysfunctional systems in place that dominate almost every aspect of our lives. Our water rights are held in private hands. That's major here in Maui. Large plantations receiving subsidies to grow crops that pollute our land, air, and water. An old boy network of landowners, business owners, and politicians that have a commitment to maintain the status quo. Monsanto silently moving in and occupying our island. No. The influence of money and politics, extreme wealth inequality, a development mentality that pursues the tourist and construction industry, land values and taxes too high for small farms, and insane regulations from the Department of Health and Safety. I mean, like, you start getting like, I don't know if we can do this. Zoning and building codes, which appear to be designed to prevent communities from gaining a stronghold. I mean, these are... It's illegal. It's illegal. No more than five unrelated people can live on a, on a single tax map key. Okay, so we know that. But is that as bad as going up against multinationals or getting raped? I mean, really. <laughs> Next one. Most of us are too comfortable. Even if we think it is a good idea, we do not have enough motivation to make real changes. Cynics, apathetic, spiritual bliss bunnies, too busy shopping shoppers, too nice a day to stress or the surf is up. We want an easy life. Some of us are too busy just trying to survive, spending extra time doing anything but recovering from working two to three jobs. Most of us have an addiction to convenience and low prices. Shopping at Costco and Walmart while complaining about big box stores and the lack of real local economy. Knowing better, but not acting on that knowledge to save a few dollars. An addiction to the bottom line. Lack of will. I mean, this is really embarrassing, but this is really what's going on here. <laughs> and I hate to like be blaming my audience, because you got here. You're the, like, the people who care. Our arrogance, or ignorance, as the greatest nation on earth, which may cause our entitlement issues. What is our oil doing under their soil? <laughs> To me, this is huge. Just 
is the way we go about managing the entire globe. We're an empire, and all of us have entitlement to the, our stuff. Our brainwashing, we have professional programming from the masters of the universe, marketing in the media, our educational system, which indoctrinates us as much as leads us to the capacity for critical thinking, cultural biases, we have rugged individualism over sacrifice for the greater good of the whole, not understanding care of the commons, belief in survival of the fittest, trusting the experts, socialism is a dirty word, corporate education, and then our ability, inability to really feel our global family, which would force us to own up to the privileges we have all received as participants in the empire. And I don't say any of this in the name of shaming. I just do it in the name of the awakening us. I mean, we really are kind of comfortable. I can claim that I've known about this for 30 years and have wanted to be doing something. And I give it a certain amount of time every week. Do I give it my all? No. It's not time yet. I can still go to Mana and get the food that I want. I can still hang out with my community group and go dancing. I can still do a lot of the things that keep my life comfortable. I am as guilty of this, so I'm not, not like trying to blame anybody. So I'm talking about awakening the heart of compassion. So one more slide. Number one reason we do not currently have Echo Villages on Maui. That's the way we think. We are in a cultural trance. So. That's my bad news. <laughs> and we could go on one more. The good news. Well, no, I'll, I'll not go there just now. All right. Um, that was not meant to like really depress us, but hopefully encourage us that if you really think this is a good idea, the time is now. Bill has got this excellent thing with smart codes. That's a wonderful transition. I have um, another presentation about building communities with farms at the center, where you can use traditional development models have a farm at the center, and then you really sort of revitalize people's lives. Because rather than having a mall, a shopping mall at the center, you have the farm there, it completely changes everything. That's a good transition to where we're going. And we could do this. We just need to get our willpower together. And it seems like this is the group that's working it, that's mm -hmm. happening. And there's another real key thing I'd like to do at some point is do a local currency. I'm very interested in doing a Maui money and we'll eventually get that happening because that's a great way to influence people on the outside. Okay, I'll stop there. So I'll answer some questions, yeah? I want to know what we can do right now to get this going. It's exactly what was being presented. You keep it, uh, the Maui Island plan with that map, everything that Bill was talking about. Because if, <coughs> if we don't get the possibility to have zones where we can have mixed density, mixed use density, then we're out. I mean, the laws are already against us right now. But as this wellspring of people, so um, one of the other things is broaden the conversation. Like if we use the topic of affordability, and we start going into Kahului, going to some of the churches and having little discussions with people who are really struggling to make it here. And letting, let, letting a broad base of people, you know, I've always been on the fringe. The fringe is what's been moving this. But never doubt it's always been a few group of people pushing this forward. All of this has been motivated from the bottom up. No government has said, hey, I've got a great idea. <laughs> Let's create a place where people can reharmonize with it. <laughs> but if people like, let's say the Filipino community, which has a really strong farming network, if they really get the possibility that they could potentially work their way into home ownership by being part of a collective farm, which is part of the community land trust, they never have to buy the land, but they could farm the land and work their way into home ownership. So when we get a broader base of people having this conversation, it'll move very quickly or if things get really bad. You know, the best thing that could happen for us is for Kahului to be shut down with a typhoon or tidal wave. That is exactly what we need to sort of wake people up. That's the other broad-based conversation we can have, disaster preparedness. What if? What if Miko shut down even the first three, five days? You know, just right there, a lot of folks who have Costco freezer food back at the back spot will we, discover quickly. We've been wanting to have that community discussion for two years. The disaster preparedness. Or framing it in a you know, uh, community, community. Self-reliance. 
getting together and being prepared. Yeah, we're well, right away for disaster. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know, the, so chapter eight of the Maui Island Plan is being reviewed. You could take a look at that and see if there's any good language to stick in it now. And if there is, showing up with it in writing couple sheets of paper, testify and hand it in like was talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, make sure the language is in that plan that says we encourage and we support at the broad level of the general plan. The next stage is the community plans are going to be updated. That's still it's a ways off though. I want to see it up in the house. Um, but getting the language at least starting if you want to work within that. Yeah. Another thing they have I could suggested. Just look through there if you wanted at some point. I'd gladly take a look at the F1. Yeah. And then you know, help assemble language. Because another thing they have suggested is give us legislation. Yeah, they Don't just it. talk about it. Give yeah. us the piece of paper that actually says. And, yeah, and put it into a format and just give it to them. And the right? good news on that is the Big Island has the Hawaii Sustainability Alliance. I'm forgetting their name at the moment, but they're working on that. Okay. They've been pushing their building codes and trying to create the legislation exactly mm -hmm. what the wording would be like. So I've got Melanie and then you. Well, how has Congo overcome those issues? I mean, we're Maui, we're part of the United States of America.